Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, pen, uh, whatever the thing before penultimate is, uh, <laughs> lecture of the spring semester. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I just want to uh, let you know that next uh, Thursday at noon we have Ambassador Kishin Rana, who's a distinguished international visitor to the International Institute, and he'll be speaking on understanding India's rise as a great power. Uh, so if you are in any confusion as to why India is such a great power, then next week at noon everything will be revealed to you. Uh, the week after that we have the final lecture. Um, there will be um, some celebrations that week of people who have obtained a certificate, FLAS students, uh, some other announcements, and there will be the uh, samosas as well. So, um, But today, let's focus on today, uh, we are really thrilled to be able to welcome Lauren Muinuddin. Um, she is an expert on maternal and child health, in particular in relation to Pakistan. Um, she kind of came into my life recently. Uh, we kind of uh, heard of each other, um, but uh, through good fortune, she came back to, Ma to Wisconsin from Pakistan through uh, Washington and uh, said, hey, I'm here. And I said, great, we need you. Um, so she's helping me with the global health course that we're teaching over in uh, global Center for Global Health. Um, and then uh, we're really um, happy to be able to invite her to speak to us today through the Center for South Asia as well. Um, the, um, I won't uh, tell you everything that she's done because that will take up the entire 40 minutes to an hour, um, but just a few snippets. Um, BA in Political Science from Columbia University, then a Master's in International Development from Columbia University School of International Affairs uh, with a concentration in South Asian Studies, we're always happy to hear that. Another master's in international maternal and child health from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she then spent 15 years, uh, approximately, uh, in Pakistan working in maternal, newborn, and child health. Um, she served as deputy chief of uh, party and chief technical advisor for the USAID Pakistan Initiative for Mothers and Newborns. And this is in addition to many, many other roles as well. So um, we're thrilled that you're here, Lauren. Thank you so much. Please help me along. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, my journey in Pakistan started uh, here at the University of Wisconsin in part. I was a student here in 1985 um, in the summer program for Urdu. Um, I studied during the two months here in preparation for a year abroad through the Berkeley Urdu program in Lahore where I studied with Kamar Saab. Um, so I've known Kamar for many years. Um, so it's it's particularly nice to be back here. Um, I, as Lalita said, I've uh, a lot of my academic uh, career has been involved in looking at issues in women's health. I studied uh, as an undergraduate at Columbia. I studied Hindi. Um, spent the year in Lahore and then returned to Columbia at the School of International Affairs where I studied uh, South Asian uh, area studies as a FLAS scholar and, um, and later went on to pursue later, some 10 years later, um, a greater concentration on maternal and newborn health, particularly looking at South Asia. Um, I not only uh, focused in my academic career in Pakistan, but I also married a Pakistani. I raised three children in Pakistan. Um, I've lived in different parts of the country, have traveled extensively there. And so my heart and a lot of my adult life and a big part of my heart is in Pakistan. Um, when I arrived in, in, 85, in 1985 as a, as a student, I was thrust into a very complex um, environment. Um, Pakistan was in the midst of an international crisis um, involving Afghanistan, the invasion of, of, of Afghanistan um, by the Soviet Union. Three million refugees on the border, living in very difficult, brutal conditions, um, abuses of human rights kind of rampant, uh, s terrible stories coming out of, out of Afghanistan. In addition, uh, in 1985, Zia al Haq was at the helm of, of Pakistan um, and was in the process of dismantling a lot of the kind of liberal legislation that had been put into place under, um, under uh, Zulfikar Bhutta, uh, particularly protective of women in the area of family law. So uh, his attempts to impose Sharia law um, 
had some very negative effects for women at that time. And in response to that, there was a very uh, uh, vocal attack, uh, a very vocal response by women's groups in Pakistan. Um, at that time, there was a rise of the Women's Action Forum, the Pakistan Human Rights Association, um, Shirkatka, uh, uh, Orit Foundation. So a lot of, there was a lot of political activism and very vocal um, um, writings and, and, and demonstrations about the attacks against certain, certain very productive uh, laws protecting women in Pakistan. Um, in addition, it was the time when Benazir Bhutto was planning on returning to Pakistan. So I was actually in Lahore in 86 when she returned, um, which was a very exciting time, I think, for everyone in the country. There's, this was before the, the kind of bad news of Benazir came to, to, to the fore. So it, it was a very exciting time to be in the country, to be involved in, um, in, in watching some, some of the, the developments that were going on there. In particular, the issue of women and women's development and women's rights um, seemed to be a question that was being posed within Pakistan itself and became for me an issue of, of great interest. I then returned to Colombia um, to, um, to do my master's in international affairs and I kind of threw myself into an interdisciplinary look at women's issues in Pakistan. Um, the review of the literature seemed to, to suggest that there was a kind of generalized bias working against women in Pakistan, um, and which was, was evident in very different aspects of their life. The lack of women's contribution to the formal economy, very low levels of literacy, um, women's vulnerability in the courts, um, fragile participation in the political process, and and very importantly for me, um, a very low health status. Um, so looking at that, I, I tried to kind of come to understand what were the factors behind, um, but behind this kind of uh, systemic bias against women. Um, part of the answer comes from looking at issues of gender, and I'm not going to get into a big discussion of gender in Pakistan, but it's, it seems to be true that um, one of the fundamental organizing principles in Pakistani culture has to do with gender. And uh, patriarchal values coupled with traditional values um, and culture has created a divide between men and women in the country, with women being placed in reproductive roles within the home and in, in the private sphere of the home, with men as breadwinners in the public sphere. This l has led to a low investment in women's human capital um, through education, through political uh, participation, um, and in investments in health. Um, this compounded with, um, with ide the ideology of parda, restrictions on women's mobility, and the concept of honor uh, linked with women's sexuality uh, really became the basis of a kind of gender discrimination and disparities in many aspects of life. Um, one of the, um, I'd say that nowhere are the effects of these disparities more evident than in the realm of health. Um, Women in Pakistan have been put at risk for poor health. Uh, their lack of decision-making power in and outside the home, um, lack of physical mobility, the lack of control over household income and, and decision-making power over resources used for health um, have often had uh, very grave implications for the health of women and their children. Um, malnutrition, anemia, high rates of infectious disease such as TB and, TB and malaria, early pregnancies for young women who are married early um, that put them at risk for, for complications, pregnancies that go on too long for older women is also a high risk factor for poor health, high fertility, um, illiteracy, and of course poverty which is uh, prevalent throughout the country. Um, 
the dearth of affordable health care services and low investment in women's health services has also um, resulted in, in, in poor health outcomes for women. And it seems that the, there are many uh, contributors to this in society, husbands, in-laws, um, religious leaders, uh, community leaders all play a role in kind of exacerbating and perpetuating customs that seem to be uh, in unconducive to health for women. Um, one of the central concerns about uh, maternal health in Pakistan has to do with fertility. Um, Pakistan is already a very populous state. It's anticipated that at current rates of fertility, the population will double by two, to, to 2050. This results in a very high uh, population of, of uh, uh, individuals under 15, which puts huge pressures on the state and puts pressures on them for the, the delivery of basic social services, education services, health services, jobs, and it has, um, of course, uh, an effect at the at the national level. So, rapid population in, rapid population growth in Pakistan um, challenges a lot of very basic um, premises. Economic growth and employment, as I said, health services, education, and clean water. The environment environmental degradation is also at risk, uh, f furthered by rapid population growth. It's estimated that, that there's approximately 5.6 million babies being born each year in Pakistan, which yields a net yearly population increase of 4 million after adjusting for uh, annual deaths, which is a lot of new people to be providing service for, services for on an annual basis. Um, the, uh, the effects of high fertility can be seen also at the individual level at the, at, at, f from a woman's point of view. High fertility, which is at four, four live births per woman on average, but that average ranges obviously in different parts of the country, so um, in parts of Balochistan and parts of NWFP where there are very few services available, particularly contraceptive uh, uh, services, uh, family planning, you'll have very, very high rates, seven and eight uh, on average, um, which is um, extremely unhealthy for, for women. Low contraceptive prevalence is is, is also a very strong contributing factor to poor health. High unmet need for family planning. That unmet need has to do with the difference between what women say their preferred number of children would be and their actual use. So it's actually an estimation of um, the lack of, of provision of service. So when we talk about religion, we talk about culture, we talk about you know different aspects of Pakistani culture being uh, it, an obstacle to providing um, family planning services, it's really not the case because many, many women say that they want the services but are they simply unable to get it. So it's really a failure of the, of the state or health services to provide, which I think is a moral failure, really. High unmet need for, for family planning leads to unwanted pregnancies, which is estimated at 11%, which doesn't seem that much. It translates, however, into a very high numbers of, of unwanted pregnancies in the country, which then leads to uh, high rates of induced abortion, which is one of the leading causes of maternal death in Pakistan. Um, so as a consequence of high fertility, there are 30,000 women approximately that are dying each year from pregnancy-related causes. Uh, there's an additional 375,000 women, and these numbers are estimates because we really don't know. Um, the data collection in, in, in Pakistan is notoriously poor. Um, events surrounding pregnancy are also um, uh, unrecorded often because many of these events occur in the home, so there's no formal uh, data collection system within the country. But what we do know is that there, there's a very high rates of morbidity associated with pregnancy in Pakistan, which leads to um, very difficult life, lives for women as a result. Fistulae, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, prolapse, um, chronic pain, um, and infertility. 
The other uh, group that's highly affected by fertility are children. Not only are children within the home at risk um, of dying earlier because of a mother that's lost, also newborn mortality, neonatal mortality is extremely high um, when associated with the maternal death. So a, a newborn's health outcome is very closely associated with the mother's, uh, with the mother's health outcome. Um, one million induced abortions a year in Pakistan. There's, prior to probably about four or five years ago, when the Population Council conducted the first study on induced abortion in Pakistan, they really didn't know how many um, abortions were taking place. It was a taboo subject, so we really didn't know. Um, but the P Population Council, um, through a kind of indirect method, um, conducted a national study um, which, talk, who, which talk to providers, you know, providers for post-abortion complications. So many women who are looking for an induced abortion will go to a private provider or to the public sector after having induced an abortion themselves, develop complications, and then this, the health system will treat them for those complications. So through this indirect method of interviews, and um, we were able to come up with a figure which is uh, approximately one million abortions, uh, one million abortions a year in Pakistan, which is extremely high and was extremely shocking, I think, for policymakers and for health, for for the general public, and had was it was kind of the breaking of a taboo subject, which was very important. Um, one thing to say also about. Um, it's uh, the issue of contraceptive prevalence. Then is um, is is one that we need to incre increase uh, increase contraceptive prevalence in order to um, reduce some of these risks of mortality. The shocking thing that was discovered in the six two thousand six two thousand seven um, PDHS the um, Pakistan Democratic de Demographic Health Survey was that there was a actual lowering or a stalling of fertility of, of contraceptive use in Pakistan um, at 30 percent. Um, there had been kind of, as you see over time, there had been a you know gra a gradual increase in contraceptive use in Pakistan, which was very uh, heartening. But the the stalling of the prevalence rate is an alarming fact. Um, so some of the indicators uh, surrounding health, the, the maternal, mortality, mor maternal mortality ratio ranges from 270 to 780. These are approximate figures we really don't know. In order to get accurate numbers of uh, maternal deaths requires a very huge sample of, of women um, because the, the events are relatively rare. Um, Meaning, one needs to look at a, at a hundred thousand births um, in order to get a, a an accurate estimation. So it's it's very difficult. It's very expensive, and it's it's been notoriously difficult to get accurate numbers. But what we know is that there is a range somewhere between 270 and parts of Punjab. Um, now this is 270 maternal deaths per hundred thousand live births. The 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 equivalent in the United States is about one in 100,000 live births. So the disparity in, in um, events is extremely high. Um, prenatal care is 60%, which is low. Um, skilled attendance um, at birth is 39%, and this is probably an overestimation. Um, however, skilled attendance is a critical element for improving health for, for birth events. Women who can deal with obstetric complications um, is a key central um, cornerstone of improved health for women. So this still remains very low. Um, women receiving postpartum care, which is important not only for 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 sepsis, for numerous events that happen postpartum for women, as well as uh, postpartum neonatal mortality. Um, uh, Post postnatal care then is a very important component. As I said, there's a there's a diversity of, of numbers throughout the country. Baluchistan, very rural area, rural areas in the country have much higher rates of maternal death. 
um, with Balochistan having numbers that don't quite approach Afghanistan, but they're 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 quite similar. Um, there's an urban bias versus an, a, a rural and urban bias. The interesting figure here is lifetime risk. A woman in Pakistan faces uh, a one in 89 um, chance of dying a maternal death. Now, if this is repeated throughout her life, every time she becomes pregnant, she faces the same risk again. So it becomes very, very dangerous to be pregnant and to have children in Pakistan. Some of the causes of maternal death, hemorrhage, hypertensive diseases, and sepsis um, are the leading causes. Um, po postpartum hemorrhage um, is, is really one of the uh, key areas of, um, one of the prim primary areas of, um, of danger for women. Um, abortion, again, also has a, has a strong, um, is also one of the leading causes. Um, Pakistan, the maternal newborn mortality rates in Pakistan are, are high despite an extensive health service network. Um, according to statistics, and again, this is, um, these figures are variable, um, approximately 80% of women deliver at home. Um, and only 5% of these deliveries are, are uh, accompanied by a skilled provider. So this means that the vast majority of women are delivering by traditional birth attendants with no training at all. Um, and as I said earlier, one of the keys to improving maternal health in Pakistan is skilled attendants. So that's one of the big areas that, that we've been pushing for. Um, The utilization of public s facilities, this is a similar slide, essentially 70% of, um, of uh, health care is sought in the private sector. And this seems to be, you know, fine. Why, why, why is the private sector not uh, uh, a viable option? Well, often it's out of reach for poor women. This is the primary problem um, because for financial reasons, many women are unable to avail themselves of uh, services within the private sector. Therefore, the public sector services provided through government, free or at very low cost, is a really important um, element um, <coughs> for providing care for poor women. Um, quality is the primary issue. Quality of care within the public sector is the primary issue, and it's an issue of confidence. You know, people arrive at public health facilities in Pakistan at the basic health units or the rural health centers, and there's no one there. There's usually no one there. There are no drugs available. Um, many of the physicians or uh, health workers, nurses that are working in the public sector also moonlight in the private sector. So often they will be off in their private clinics. Um, when an obstetric emergency is happening, one really can't wait. The other issue is that the supply of drugs, operational, 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week obstetric services, which include uh, C-section, availability of C-sections, transfusion of blood, um, you know, key, ser uh, key obstetric services are critical um, for saving a woman's life who's in the throw of an obstetric emergency. Um, why is it still so high? Um, Part of it has to do with, uh, with a lack of awareness within communities and families. Um, an obstetric, you know, pregnancy is a natural event, um, so people don't associate it ne necessarily with um, uh, complications. Families are very poor, and when they need to make decisions about using, you know, uh, limited resources, they often won't plan in advance for putting financial resources aside to, to uh, pay for an emergency, or they don't have contingency planning um, for an emergency. They just, there's a, a lack of awareness of the risks, and there's also a lack of appropriate behaviors within the home and communities related to reproductive health. Um, as I said, there's lack of access of good quality in the, of quality of care in the public sector. There's poor technical capacity. A lot of the, uh, health providers in the public sector are, are 
trained but have no have received no refresher training so they've been you know out of their uh, out of their studies for 10 15 years and they have never had refresher training or never had an updated um, uh, training um, so some of the things that can be done at the health facility level um, essential services include as I've said uh, skilled attendants essential obstetric care for management of complications which includes the supply of uh, life-saving drugs um, family planning again is a critical element um, for uh, saving lives and post-abortion care other uh, Access to surgical care, access to blood transfusions are also uh, for obstruct, obstructed labor. Um, these are two critical elements for improving um, outcomes. In the community, proper nutrition, reduced workload, knowledge of the signs of threatening complications are very important. Having finances in place are, uh, is also an important element. Having transportation in place, having a contingency birth plan essentially in place is critical. Um, some progress has been made in maternal health. Um, there's kind of a there's been a gradual increase in the use of uh, in in facility deliveries, although it's still insufficient. There's also been some increase in skilled attendance in Pakistan, but it still lags behind. Uh, the need. Quickly, some of the child health indicators. I, I talk here, you know, my focus here really is on maternal health, but uh, newborn health is, is integrate, uh, integrally linked to maternal health. So we see under five mortality and infant mortality rates at a, a level that has lowered over the years, but m neonatal mortality really has remained unchanged. Um, and this is due to the link between maternal health and the need for very specific services at the time of birth in order to save neonates. Um, this, this slide essentially shows that there's been very little change over, you know, for, for 20 years um, in, in mortality rates for children in Pakistan. And again, neonatal mortality has remained very high and um, no progress has been made in this. Um, so some of the top preventions, that th this, the, this is from the, um, the Lancet series, um, which describes some of the essential interventions for uh, children under five. Prevention, um, interestingly, breastfeeding alone has a very strong impact on improving child mortality. Um, insect treated uh, materials for prevention of malaria is also uh, a very important um, um, intervention. Treatment interventions for children under five, oral rehydration therapy is one of the top, again, for diarrheal diseases for children under five. This is one of the top uh, treatment interventions. <coughs> Um, I'm moving kind of quickly through this. Uh, this slide, I think, is probably one of the best kind of uh, descriptions of what needs to be done in order to improve maternal. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I will just walk through it quickly. The pathway to care, uh, to care and survival. Now, this has been um, adopted by the Ministry of Health and by international NGOs in Pakistan as being kind of the, the, uh, the plan of action. And it, it deals both with community level interventions and has, has to do with what needs to happen at the facility level as well. Um, on the left, you know, the guiding principles of, of putting together a program that really serves women and their children uh, has to do with involvement of all the stakeholders. Um, building integrated systems, developing uh, development of upscale activities, addressing gender inequalities, building on lessons learned. But as we go across, there's four steps. Um, recognition of the problem. This has to do with recognition of the problem at the community level. Really, people need to be aware through, through behavior change communication, which is a whole area in, in health interventions where 
uh, communities are uh, through through group discussions, through work with uh, lady health workers, and through community health workers, the dangers of of uh, both pregnancy and delivery are discussed um, and and understood by the community. So, and actions are taken to to put it, plans into into effect. Um, this decision to seek care. So this means increasing access both within the community for preventive care through networks of community health workers and at the facility level as well, um, which includes um, improving the service delivery system, including private sector providers, which is a very important intervention. Um, innovative solutions to, to resolve transport Building uh, relationships with transport organizations with, within the, the community is also an important element. Strengthening the quality. Um, this has to do with developing protocols and guidelines within health service, uh, you know, where providers are, are trained on specific uh, protocols and guidelines to, to reduce mortality improvement, quality improvement mechanisms, rehabilitating services within public health facilities, water supplies, um, ORs, um, you know, neonatal intensive care units where children can be um, resuscitated. Increasing the capacity, um, this is really to do with the increasing the capacity of service providers, uh, training, um, uh, retraining of public uh, providers uh, in maternal and newborn care and integration and better management of services so maternal immunization services um, um, logistic systems uh, drug supply all of these issues have to kind of be brought together and better managed at the district level um, and if all of these things are put into place newborn and maternal survival increases. So getting back a little bit, this is kind of the, the technical part of the discussion, and I wanted to talk um, a little bit more about, um, you know, what has happened in Pakistan. Um, in, in 1984, in 1994, I'm sorry, the ICTB, uh, ICPD conference um, uh, was held, which really um, emphasized the need for family planning and reproductive health as being central not only to women's development but to to maternal and child survival. Um, this would have effects on stabilizing world population growth, um, but also would be extremely important for um, for women. Um, and improving women and children's survival. Um, throughout the 1990s and 2000, when I was in Pakistan, um, Pakistan too signed on to the ICPD principles. Um, so in, in the early 90s and throughout the 2000s, there was really a, a kind of a coming together of public, uh, of, the, of the public sector, of private providers, of academics, um, a, a community of intellectuals who really wanted to try to, uh, to, to improve the quality of health in Pakistan for women. The social action program, which went on for a number of years, was uh, a, a big government push. The training of TBAs was another um, uh, intervention. The introduction of the Lady Wor Health Worker Program, which was one of Benazir's, um, one of Benazir's uh, kind of probably most uh, productive um, introductions of, of policy in the country. An MCH cell was created within the Ministry of Health. And international donor support was really focused towards maternal and child health. Um, uh, the United States, the, the British through DFID, the Norwegians and the Swedes all were very um, helpful in channeling donor funding towards maternal and child health and providing technical assistance to the country. So there was really a, 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 a kind of surge and an understanding within the country that this was a priority and this needed to be taken care of. Um, many 
interesting projects came up, the Pakistan Initiative for Maternal Newborn Health that I was involved with, uh, which was a 20 district program in all four provinces. It really was using the state of the art kind of interventions. It was well financed. It had the support of the government at the federal level, the provincial level, the district level. So that everyone was really on board for making this happen. And there has been some progress made in that. Um, yet, assistance to Pakistan and internationally for reproductive health and for family planning has started to dwindle. Um, this is where I want to kind of open up the discussion. Um, in the last years, Pakistan has been beset by numerous difficulties. Um, we've all read about them in the press. The earthquake in 2005, um, the civil unrest in Swat and uh, NWFP, the floods of 2010, the, the global war on terror, which has diverted national attention away from, from health issues to governance issues, to law and order issues. Um, and within the arena of decreased international support for family planning and for reproductive health in the face of other infectious disease such as malaria, TB, and, and HIV, population and family planning has really taken a back seat. So despite the progress, despite the kind of uh, uh, consensus that had been built over a number of years in Pakistan to provide better care for women and children, we really are at an impasse at this point. You know, donor support has kind of dwindled in Pakistan. The embassies are, are closing because of law and order. The United States and Pakistan are on this um, very uh, strange and um, incomprehensible dance around, you know, security issues. And the issues of development have kind of been put by the wayside. Um, Pakistan's on the on the you know at the at, on the verge of becoming a failed state. I don't want to you know whether one agrees with that that uh, term or not. The the issue nonetheless is that there is extremely weak governance within the country. There's high levels of corruption. There's um, you know violent attacks on a daily basis within the country. Uh, hyperinflation. Poverty is on the rise. Um, the population uh, rate continues to increase, which will have implications for, um, you know, numerous aspects of health and 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 social service delivery, and and the you know environmental degradation, particularly around the issue of water. Um, so Pakistan's in a very fragile situation, and women, as a result, too, are despite the progress that has been made, remain again the most vulnerable group, women and children. So I just, I would like to just open up the discussion a little bit about what, where can we go from here given this environment? Um, what are the options? What, rather than continuing to rely upon the state to be the primary provider of health care within the country, what are the alternatives? Are there other models that we can look to? The private sector, um, you know, can we start engaging really with the private sector and, and leave the, the public facilities to the side and really start to find new ways of delivering health care to women? Um, so I will open it up for discussion on that, on that note. Great, thank you very much, Lauren. Yeah, Basically, if people aren't familiar with what's going on, every ministry is being devolved. So there is no Ministry of Health anymore, as far as I know. There is no Ministry of Education, there's no Ministry of Culture, there's no Ministry of anything. Every ministry has now been devolved to the provinces. So this may help, in fact, because then the provinces, instead of having a federal, federal center, which is what the problem has been, which was supposed to be sending things to the provinces, now the provinces themselves have the authority and the resources and the funds to actually do things 
within a province. So yeah, that might actually help depending on how uh, each province will, will um, prioritize things. Well, devolution has, you know, in the health sector, that's been a big, um, uh, there's been a big push for devolution. Of, I mean, as in all sectors, there has been a de the, the devolving of services down to the provincial and district levels. The problem has to do with really capacity. And in my experience there, the, the individual capacity of district administrators, because they haven't had the, the kind of training um, in budget management and in, in HMIS, you know, in, in, in information systems, it still is chaotic and, and unproductive and, and, and clogged, you know. I mean, before the money's coming down from the federal government to the districts was, was, you know, was difficult to get through and that the devolution process was supposed to ease up that flow, but it's become mucked up at the bottom now, and at least in my, um, in my experience. For instance, there, there was funds available for community support, um, CBO, I mean, for the, the development of community-based organizations, and each district government was given a pot of money. And there was a, you know, application process by which individuals or communities would come to, to um, apply for funds for different, you know, development projects within their, within their villages. But the paperwork um, and the lack of training both for the communities and individuals and the people who were administering these funds um, was wasn't there, and as a result, the money went unspent um, for for year upon year upon year, and then was lost. So that was one experience I had with devolution in terms of trying to get monies out to communities. So it, it wasn't that effective in my in my um, experience. First of all, well, wonderful, was really very good, and you are doing such a wonderful, very good work. For Pakistan and the Pakistan sure. community, I have one, one, one clarification I want, and then one comment. Like you said that uh, uh, towards the end, like what what we need to do, like uh, private uh, sector's contribution. So that is in addition to public sector you meant, or like ignoring public sector and just relying on private sector. Well, no, I think that, you know, the, there's a role for public sector. There, There is a role for public sector, particularly for very poor women. So one would hope that over time, or, or I'm not sure what the mechanism will be, that the public sector will remain a, you know, a provider of, of services, not not only health, but education services and other. Yet in the in the face of a of very poor and very poor governance, um, and inability really to deliver on the services, there has to be a parallel track. Um, and the private sector is flourishing in Pakistan. It's, it's making money, people are being trained. You know, so there's, there's a whole group of people, although it's unregulated. That's, I think, probably one of the key areas that we can work on is regulating the private sector, licensing providers, um, you know, uh, retraining providers ac according to international standards and protocols, um, using social marketing um, for for essential drugs for f for maternal health and for family planning. That's been extremely um, successful in Pakistan. The social marketing of contraceptives through um, the the Green Star. Uh, Social marketing. They they are they are one of the major providers of family planning services in the country through small pharmacies. So they're they're the private sector needs to be pulled in and and regulated and involved and trained and and that they become part of the national dialogue and that it's not a, a just a free for all. Um, they do provide the the majority of services and so we need to you know, work more closely in, in a more, you know, organized manner with the private sector is my view. Um, yeah, I, um, I have a puzzle for you. I was part of a group which looked at the conditions of Muslims in India. And we compared a large variety of variables uh, for Muslims in other groups. Uh, what struck us a great deal was that despite lower levels of education, lower unemployment, higher unemployment rates, lower per capita expenditures, uh, Muslims show, showed lower infant mortality, lower child mortality. 
and both infant and child mortality as compared to as compared to, to other groups in India in India mm -hmm. and not only uh, infant and child mortality rates were <coughs> lower they had fallen faster uh, mm -hmm. and the sex ratios were better uh, which one can probably explain uh, through various things uh, when you compare their access to health infrastructure which was not significantly different um, um, the skilled versus unskilled um, uh, kind of pregnancy uh, thing, there was not much difference. Uh, so we have been trying to figure out whether there are differences in child rearing practices <coughs> uh -huh. uh, between Muslims and others, and whether that can explain uh, this difference. Apart from the fact that work participation rates are much lower for Muslim women uh, than for other groups, so one of the hypotheses has been that because women are at home, they're able to provide better care to the child. Um, I don't know whether that's correct or not, but that's one of the hypotheses. Uh, so given that uh, kind of a situation, how will you sort of look at the Pakistan context? I mean, they, they come from the same stock. They may have similar child rearing practices. Um, uh, but do you know the differences? Uh, I, I'm not sure what the differences in, for instance, mortality rates between Muslims in India and Muslims in Pakistan. I, I, don't, I, don't, know. I don't know that number either. So, I mean, it's difficult to say about Pakistan, but the vast majority being, um, I mean, <coughs> Muslim. So, uh, I mean, there are... So if the child rearing practices are important, they might be similar in two countries. Um, well, it'd be interesting to see that. I mean, whether whether there are. I mean, one could look at in with within the Christian community. Um, in and there's a small ma majority of Hindus in Pakistan. I suppose you could compare um, mortality rates among those groups and come to an answer. I, I'm not quite sure. All the variables that you listed uh, are, in some sense, adverse for Muslims in India, mm -hmm. uh, but they show this striking pattern consistently year after And what is the difference between, just approximately the difference <coughs> between the mortality rates between Muslims and others? Um, and I don't and remember the numbers, but they are, uh, in some years, statistically uh, significantly lower, but consistently lower across all years. Okay. Well, that's an interesting finding. I, 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 I don't really know the... I mean, given, as I said, Pakistan has the majority of Muslims, we, I don't know the... You didn't share data on birth rates. Birth rates are also better for Muslim children, which in some sense reflects the health of the mother. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So to us, it came as a big, huge surprise because we were not expecting this. Mm -hmm. being the oh, that is an interesting finding. I guess Thank I'm wondering you if, um, if you have to look at geography there, because the, the rates in Pakistan are, are dragged down significantly by these enormous rural areas, and perhaps the Muslim population in India is more urban-based. Mm. That's, so that's so very I true. I think religion is perhaps not your factor there to look at. Yeah, so you control for rural and urban, the difference is It's persist. The difference is persist. You control persist. for region, you control for rural and urban, you control really? for all kinds of controls. Well, you guys need to talk. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I have a couple of questions over there. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a, I have a short question. Versus, uh, what was the, what was the level of awareness about the use of contraceptives in the rural areas? And my second question would be, uh, you have been there in, in recent years, and there was a local government system working in Pakistan that was at the district level. So many of the health facilities came under the local nazim, the local administrator of the district. So I I'm from Karachi, so I've seen some improvement in Karachi. But I just want to know what like what were what was your observation in in other areas of Pakistan uh, with how the local governments were performing uh, in the health sector. Well, I, as I was saying, I think that the uh, you know devolution was a big um, there was a big push and it, it was an exciting kind of moment in, in in dealing with a lot of the you know governance problems, you know, for, for social services. So um, it sounded like a very good idea, um, you know, remo taking the, the, the powers away from the federal government, giving it to the, the provinces and then further down. My finding, however, is that the Nazim who would become, became kind of like the, the, 
district commissioners, you know, again, it, it was kind of a recreation of the same kind of concentration of power within the one individual, and it, it, didn't, it didn't have a democratizing effect, in my view. It had a kind of, um, it, it seemed to kind of perpetuate a little bit of the, you know, the Nazim kind of doling out the, the, the funds to, to favorites, you know, to, 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 to uh, political cronies. I don't, you know, it didn't, I, my experience, and I'm not, and, and I don't think I'm probably the only one to say that devolution hasn't really been a huge success in Pakistan. And I mean, I think that that's pretty much across the board. The idea and practice was good, but I think that the, um, you know, concentrating the f development funds on the Nazim, who often also doesn't have the kind of background and training that's necessary to identify the real needs in a community, um, uh, or, or, or the people that are advising him don't seem to kind of, um, haven't been able to come up with the kinds of, you know, priorities using data to kind of figure out what, what are the priorities in a particular district, what are the nagging problems, how, you know, what's first, what's second, what's, what's viable, what's not viable. So sorting through those priorities is, is kind of a technical job and, and many of these individuals didn't, I don't think had the, the background or the training necessary to kind of you know, use those funds to their best um, purpose. Um, and my second question was, are there, are there the awareness and rural areas about contraceptives? There is awareness. I mean, there's there's high awareness. Of, it's it's higher than one thinks. I don't have the actual figures in front of me, but the you know obviously awareness of traditional methods um, is relatively high. Um, as you go further out in the rural areas, where uh, you have you know little communication with women through uh, through uh, community health workers, or you have poor service delivery coverage or service coverage. And women tend to know about it um, less. I, I, the exact figures I don't have in front of me. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you were talking a little bit about um, the little involvement women have towards the political process. Yeah. Um, and how that has played a role in the oppressing women or just like keeping them down. Um, so I'm wondering what has been done to empower women. Um, economically um, because that also like helps with a lot of mental issues as well um, and in terms of like doing that in collaboration with health because I feel like just focusing on, on health. providing these services right isn't necessarily going to help them because they're still always going to feel dependent and not empowered so I'm wondering if like like well, microfinance. I mean, I think microfinance, although it hasn't been as widespread in Pakistan as it has, you know, in other in, in Bangladesh and India, where it's really taken off um, with with some some recent problems, apparently. Um, yet, microfinance really has not been a huge component, and I agree with you entirely. I mean, I, although I believe that fundamentally health, you know, is the basis upon what which women will um, increase their participation um, in politics and in, in, in the economy, th those, those opportunities really haven't been pursued uh, as much as they should be in Pakistan. And I completely agree that I think uh, providing finances for women to small, start small businesses and to, and is, is a, extremely important, and education. I mean, we haven't talked about education at all, but that is the, the primary contributor to improved health. I mean, the correlation between increased public, uh, education and health status is, is extremely close. So those are the big areas to push on in parallel. I mean, and, and some people say that, you know, forget, you know, working on, on uh, contraceptive prevalence, um, just work on education and have the big push be there because it, it, it has immediate uh, effects in every other area, um, which I am a big believer in as well. But again, this the services provided by the state um, have become a, are a real problem. They they really haven't delivered. And despite a number of years of having the rhetoric and the talk and, and the 
and you know the kind of consciousness that these are important issues for development in the country they haven't produced and and as the country goes down a road of even you know greater instability um, I think we can look even less to the state to provide those so again relying on you know alternative um, methods for educating women and providing health services is going to have to be the wave of the future it seems I mean I guess you've kind of already commented to the question that you posed to us a bit at the end of your presentation I'm curious if you could just comment a little bit. Do you see any silver lining of hope? Are there community-based organizations that you think are providing a model in this failing state for any hope? Or are you pretty <coughs> pessimistic about it? things? I mean, I think that there are examples of, you know, the, the, the group that I worked with, um, the, the Pakistan Initiative for Mothers and Newborns was in 20 districts. It, it really had a very broad range. It was dealing with all different types of communities. And this, this model of service delivery, working with the community, linking health services, working with private providers, working with stakeholders, was a model that seemed to really work in many, many <coughs> different settings in Pakistan. And they had good results. They also had $100 million. Um, you know, so it money money matters. Um, there there are brilliant organizations. There are incredibly smart people in Pakistan. There's incredibly dedicated people that I've come across in Pakistan working on these issues. Um, but they're in in a really difficult environment. I mean, the the whole national psyche has been, I think, changed in many ways by the violence that is that's going on. I mean, it really. It has, a, you know, the number of people that are killed on a daily basis now is maybe relatively small, but it, 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 it's, it's clamped down. People have clamped down, and um, you know, I, I, at this point, I really until they, until there can be some resolution to um, to this influx of this extremism in the country, I, I really don't, I don't have a lot of. Uh, I mean, within the Pakistani people, I have immeasurable um, confidence um, within the current governing systems and, and the environment. I, I'm, for the time being, I'm quite, quite pessimistic, unfortunately. Can I um, end the discussion with a kind of philosophical question? This is something that, that's, that's bothered me for a very long time, and this is to do with patriarchy and the fact that um, patriarchy oppresses women is not particular to Pakistan, and I think there's extra extra influences there, um, and the concept of honor, I thought that was very interesting that you brought that into the discussion. But I just wonder, and I don't know whether, I mean, this is a huge question, but maybe you have some thoughts on that. How does patriarchy, if you think of it as a system, um, justify the lack of investment in women, if only because women create a new generation of men? It, it, it seems so limited to just, okay, we don't care about women, we don't care about girl children, fine, even if that is your basic, but it only takes one minor step to see that you're cutting yourself off, even if you are completely within the patriarchal mindset. So you don't even need to be that enlightened to see that that's not gonna go anywhere. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, it, it is bewildering. Yeah, it's, it's it, it makes no sense. I mean, patriarchy doesn't make a lot of sense to me anyway, but that's <laughs> another story. But even within, its, even within its own logic, it's illogical. Well, I would, I would have to agree wholeheartedly, and I'm afraid I don't really have an answer to that. Um, but, but, but you know, on the, but on the flip side, you know, women, I, I've never been in a culture in which at the same time, women are revered as they are. You know, I don't know how to describe that, but it's true that you know, within the home, um, women are the you know the queens of their home in many ways, and that they, you know, dominate the men in so many aspects of life. You know, the women are really in control. In in some way, they're the kind ones of ones that survive their eight live children. Exactly. I I I I I wish I had an answer. I think we'd probably make some progress right. if we were able to answer that question. Well, thank you very much for a very thoughtful Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.